this panel will focus on the Balfour Declaration. And it is, this event is co-sponsored by the Department of Political Science, the Department of History, the Burkle Center for International Relations, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures, the Center for Near Eastern Studies, the Center for Middle East Development, the UCLA Allen Levy Center for Jewish Studies, and of course the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Uh, my name is Yoram Cohen. I'm the director of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all of you here and to welcome our panel of uh, distinguished you know, scholars. Uh, I will let our moderator, Shira Efron of uh, the RAND Corporation, uh, to introduce uh, the speakers. And I just wanted to say just a few words about our moderator. Uh, Shira Efron is a policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Uh, she's a special advisor in Israel uh, with uh, RAND, Center for Middle East Public Policy, and also a professor at the Hardy RAND Graduate School. Uh, at, at RAND, she is uh, launching uh, a unique program on, on Israel, as well as continuing research on various Middle East uh, topics, including food, water, energy, security, public health, technology, adoption, and much, and much more. Uh, her research, which focuses on analysis of Middle East issue with a focus on Israel-Palestinian conflict and other elements, really puts her in a very unique position to be a moderator in our panel today. I should also say that she was a policy director and country representative of the Institute for Inclusive Security in Israel. Uh, she was previously a policy analyst at the Center for American Progress, where she edited the Middle East Bulletin, a multi-weekly online publication for high-level U.S. government and stakeholders. Uh, I should say that uh, her interests and security interests in the Middle East uh, are in the Middle East, but also uh, in North Africa. She was also a research analyst uh, in various other uh, areas, uh, including those that are involved in, uh, in fundraising, investments, and also was an editor at the Israel newspaper, Har Haaretz. And I, I should say also that uh, uh, Shira Efron uh, received her PhD in policy analysis from the Rand uh, Graduate School, an MA from the International Relations and International Business from New York University, and a bachelor's degree in biology and computer science from Tel Aviv University. So that really puts her in an extraordinary position to evaluate uh, all those areas that have to do with security, food, energy, and so on. So let me just say that uh, it is really an in, uh, the event today and, and dealing with the Balfour Declaration uh, is of tremendous interest to, to many. I think that in history of the Middle East and, uh, and certainly Israel, uh, I don't know if there has been any other instance where there is so much that has been written about, researched about a very short uh, few sentences or a declaration, uh, one that has really shaped uh, uh, the country shaped opinions uh, over the years, but I'm going to let the panel talk about it. But I just wanted to, you know, briefly uh, read to you uh, the declaration. Uh, and this uh, declaration by Lord, uh, by Balfour, uh, which he wrote to Lord uh, uh, Rothschild, where he says, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty government the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist uh, aspirations which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty government view, and this is where the declaration begins, His Majesty government view with the favor of establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this project. It is being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by, Jewish, by, by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful 
if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation, you know, signed by Balfour. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, <coughs> the mic to uh, Shira Efron and uh, enjoy. Um, and thank you for all of you for being here. I must admit, I'm quite impressed. Um, in today's day and age, it's not easy to find a lot of people willing to engage in in-depth discussions about historical events. And um, thank you for all the uh, centers and academic uh, institutions that uh, are partnering on this event today. And um, thank you for our panelists. Uh, I'll introduce them in a minute. Um, you know, as we are wrapping up, getting ready for the holiday season, wrapping up 2017, 2017 was such a year full of anniversaries uh, in the context of Zionism and um, Israel. And we're going to discuss one of them now, but I think it's important to, to remember this event, momentous event, did not come in in silo. It's, it's part of a sequence of other events. So if we go back 120 years ago, that was the first Zionist Congress. Um, it was called by Theodor Herzl in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland. And during this meeting, it was agreed um, that Zionism really seeks to establish a home for the Jewish people in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel. Uh, the second event came 20 years later, and is the Balfour Declaration. We'll go into it in depth in a moment. Um, 30 years later came the UN Partition Plan. In 1947, the UN General Assembly um, decided on the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states, with Jerusalem to be an international city. Um, the Jewish agency accepted the plan, reluctantly, but accepted it. Um, we know the Palestinians and Arabs felt that it was injustice um, to ignore the rights of the majority of the, 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 the population at the time, um, rejected it. They formed uh, volunteer armies infiltrated into Palestine, and you know we know, we know the history, um, the War of Independence and the establishment of the State of Israel. And finally, I think the fourth uh, momentous event that people have been discussing in length this year is the um, 50 year to the 67 war, the six day war, um, which really not a lot has changed geographically since, since then. Now, I wanna go back um, to, to the topic of today's discussion, the going back 100 years ago. Yoram just read to us the Balfour Declaration. It really is just a letter, a short letter dated um, November 2nd, 1917, um, in which the British government, it, it made public its support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people um, in Palestine. Uh, Yoram read you the letter, and some of you, I see some copies here. Why are we still talking today, 100 years after, about 67 words? That's what it is, <laughs> 67 words. Well, you know, interestingly, in the Middle East, 100 years is not so long of a time. Uh, and we can, we can you know, discuss I, uh, later, what's, I, are we gonna be talking about it in another 100 years from now? Um, in, the fact is that it is still a, a matter of discussion and divisive in some circles in the Jewish world, in Israel. This is really um, seen as a moment, the conception of what would become the state of Israel. Um, if you speak with Palestinians in particular, but also in the Arab world, they will tell you, well, that, that, that is uh, the original sin when the idea of Israel was conceived. Um, and the rights of the Palestinians for self-determination was ignored. Um, we can talk about it in the questions and answers, but if you saw the uh, demonstrations in West Bank towns, um, just on the, the, the cent centennial, um, you would see that this is very much still uh, something that um, is in the hearts of many Palestinians today and their leadership. Um, whereas in Israel, of course, it's celebrated um, globally. I really cannot think of better uh, experts to discuss these topics with us today. Uh, worldwide, those are probably the most uh, prominent um, experts on this topic. Um, I will not read their full bios because I hope you should have them, but I will read uh, a little bit. The way we'll do it is I'll jump, I'll introduce all three speakers now. Uh, then, um, because I, um, it's my, my fortune to be able to ask them just a couple of questions, and then we'll open it to Q&A uh, from you. So our first speaker today is Professor Jonathan Schneer. Uh, Professor Schneer is a modern British historian at Georgia Tech in the School of History, Technology, and Society. 
He's the author of the Balfour Declaration, The Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, which won um, in 2010 the National Jew uh, Jewish Book Award, uh, as well as six other books. Um, he has served as book review editor and many and on the auditor auditorial boards of uh, several journals, uh, many more than I can count, and really is the recipient of multiple fellowships, including the American Council of Learned Societies and Oxford and Cambridge. Professor Schneer teaches modern British and modern uh, European history to undergrad and uh, graduate students. Um, our second speaker is Mark uh, Rader. He's Professor of Modern Jewish History in the Department of History at the University of Cincinnati and Director of the University Center for Studies in Jewish Education and Culture. He is also Visiting Professor of American Jewish History at Hebrew Union College, uh, Jewish Institute of Religion. Um, he has authored and co-authored numerous books, including The Emergence of American Zionism, Abba Hillel Silver and the American Zionism, and American Jewish Woman and the Zionist Enterprise. Um, there, there are quite a few more on that list. Um, Professor Ryder teaches courses on U.S. history, American culture, the American Jewish experience, modern Jewish history, and Zionism in Israel. Before the University of Cincinnati, he was the founding director of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University at Albany, State University of New York, and served as the di director of the Posen Foundation Education Project. Um, and last but not least is Ian uh, Lustig, a professor and Bess um, W. Heyman Chair in Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Lustig is interested in comparative politics, international politics, Middle Eastern politics, and agent-based computer-assisted modeling for social sciences. Um, simple topics. <laughs> um, he teaches courses on Middle Eastern politics, political identities and institutions, techniques of hegemonic analysis and expansion and contradiction of states, and on relationships among complexity, evolution, and politics. He's the recipient of multiple awards, I see a recurring theme here, um, from the Carnegie Corporation, the National Science Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Before Penn, Professor Lustig taught for 15 years at Dartmouth and worked for one year in the Department of State. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's please um, start with you, Professor Schneer. John. Thank you. Um, and, and before I begin, I have to thank a bunch of people, too. I have to thank Yoram Cohen and Maura Resnick, of course. And I've never met but Christian Rodriguez. I don't know if he's here. If he is, he's the best expediter I've run into. Um, and finally, Shira, for that fulsome introduction. Thank, and thank you all for coming. Um, so why did the British government do it? That's what I want to talk about um, today. Uh, I won't repeat uh, the Balfour Declaration, which I too thought I might read or read part of. Why did they do it? A hundred years ago, World War I was still raging. Europe was a charnel house. Nobody knew which side would win. It would have taken a, um, a foolish person to predict with confidence what the outcome of the war would be. Uh, Russia was just about out. It was, she was on, on her knees, practically on her back, and soon would be out of the war. And the United States had entered the war, but had not yet sent soldiers in sufficient numbers to make any kind of a difference on the uh, Western Front. It was in this context that uh, Arthur Balfour um, dispatched the famous letter to Lord Walter Rothschild now, historians have offered a number of reasons explaining this decision. The first that they offer is that the British government uh, had within it members who sympathized with Jewish people, uh, victims of oppression for centuries. Uh, another reason that has been offered, and it overlaps with the first one, is that among the members of the government were so-called Christian Zionists, uh, including Balfour himself and the Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. And these were men who would have taken some um, satisfaction uh, in framing policies that would expedite the return of Jews to Palestine and thus the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
Um, a third reason offered by historians is that Lloyd George in particular wanted to do something for Chaim Weizmann, the Zionist leader, who was also a brilliant chemist and who had made an important contribution to the British war effort by um, figuring out how to derive acetone, which was an important component of explosives, uh, explosives from grain rather than wood. And when he asked Weizmann what, uh, how he could reward him, Weizmann is supposed to have said, I want nothing for myself but Palestine for my people. Um, another reason put forward by historians is, uh, has to do with the strategic importance of Palestine, which of course uh, overlooks Egypt, in which is located the Suez Canal the Suez Canal in 1914 was the um, jugular vein, the economic jugular vein of Great Britain. Through it flowed in both directions trade worth millions and millions of pounds. And the British, it is argued by some historians, um, wanted to ensure that Palestine, which overlooked the strategic um, Suez Canal, uh, would have within it a stable, contented, grateful European population, um, especially if the British established a protectorate there, hence the Balfour Declaration. A fifth reason offered by historians um, is that the British wanted to forestall the Germans. Uh, there was fear that Germany would make some kind of statement favorable to Zionism and that then Germany would reap the rewards and Britain wanted to get in ahead. Um, I think of these five explanations, all of them have at least a kernel of truth with the probable exception of the business about gratitude to Weizmann for his um, scientific discoveries. Nothing I have ever seen in the archives suggests that that was a factor. I think it's a lovely story, but I don't think it's probably a true one. Um, but the, um, the argument about moving before the Germans could move points, I think, to the most important reason of all. The British government did believe in 1917 that it needed Jewish support in order to win World War I. Um, most of, I don't want to say most, many members of the British governing elite held anti-Semitic stereotypical views. They believed that Jews um, exercised some kind of vast subterranean world power and that they had great influence over finance and contradictorily over world socialism. And so they thought that American Jewish financiers might have the power to persuade the American president, Woodrow Wilson, to join the war. And they also thought that Russian Jews, socialist Jews, might have the power to persuade the Russian government not to get out of the war, to stay in the war. So then the question became how to win the support of world Jewry, as they called it. And the answer they came up with was to offer them Palestine. Now, why did they decide that was the answer? Because Chaim Weizmann persuaded them that it was the right answer. So we come to Weizmann, uh, a remarkable figure, born in Russia, educated mainly in Germany and Switzerland. He was now at the um, outbreak of World War I, a reader in chemistry at the University of Manchester. And he was, of course, also a Zionist. Um, as Shira said, the World Zionist Federation was founded in 1897 by the Austrian journalist Theodor Herzl, who had become convinced that Jews needed their own country after witnessing um, the anti-Semitic events surrounding the Dreyfus Affair in France. That country was Palestine. And Palestine, before World War I, was part of the Ottoman Empire. And so what Herzl's Zionist organization wanted to do was to persuade the Ottomans to permit massive Jewish immigration into Palestine or 
conceivably at some future date to let Palestine go altogether. But they had no success on either front. And so the Zionist strategy became to find a great power that would press the Ottomans on their behalf. And before 1914, the Zionists had very little luck. They did have, by 1914, um, an international presence with headquarters in Berlin. And in Great Britain, there was an English Zionist Federation. There were other nationalist Jewish organizations as well. But to give you some understanding of their significance, there were about 40 million British citizens in 1914, of whom 300,000 were Jewish, which is to say less than one-tenth of one percent, of whom, of the 300,000, 8,000 belonged to one Zionist group or another. The fact is that in 1914, most British Jews had no time for Zionism. It's not that they were hostile to it. It's that they didn't think it was realistic politics. They thought it was a pretty idea, um, but that it was entirely unrealistic. That there was latent support for Zionism would become apparent later. Um, Weizmann had been no more successful than other British Zionists uh, in the pre-1914 era. He was not even one of the handful of leaders of the English Zionist Federation. He, uh, he was sort of in the top third, you might say, or top quarter. But he would emerge as the undisputed leader of Zionism, British Zionism, during World War I. Why? Um, when the war began, Weizmann, and no doubt others, immediately understood that this was a golden opportunity for Zionism. Of course he was appalled by the war and the destruction, but he saw something else. Finally, Zionist, Zionist interests and British interests would coincide because the aim was to defeat the Ottoman Empire. And what Weizmann wanted was for Britain to defeat Turkey, to establish a protectorate in Palestine, and then to permit unrestricted Jewish immigration there. Now, no doubt there were many other Zionists, and not only Zionists, who understood this, but Weizmann proved to be uniquely able to speak to the British political elite. This Russian immigrant somehow found a way, found the language, found the manners. Um, and he was also um, a, a remarkably adept uh, practitioner of what I would call political, political jujitsu, which is to say that he could turn the strengths of his opponents to his own advantage. Um, he turned anti-Semitism to his own advantage. The anti-Semites said, or well, Weizmann said to the anti-Semites, you think Jews have vast subterranean influence? Well, you're right, we do. <laughs> you need us during this emergency more than ever. He was charismatic, he was compelling, and he embarked upon a political charm offensive teaching the principles of Zionism to the British governing elite. And the first lesson that he taught was that Jews need their own country just as any other nationality does. He had to overcome British Jews who previously had spoken for the community and who were anti-Zionist. These were the assimilationists, um, many of them among the most wealthy and successful Jews in Britain. And these people argued that the Jews do not represent a nation. Rather, they share a culture. They share a belief system. And that can be followed anywhere. It is not connected to a specific locality. It's not tied to a place. And the assimilationists argued that Jews should therefore assimilate in the countries where they lived. Uh, and in Britain, the Jews should become like the other non-conforming Protestant sects, the non-Anglican Protestants. They also argued um, that Zionism opened Jews to the charge of dual allegiance. If Palestine was the true and only home of Jews, then what were they doing in London or in Paris or in Los Angeles? Um, Anti-Semites would begin to say, go home, get out of here. And one of the most important assimilationists said, quote, 
Palestine will become the world's ghetto. Now, the assimilationists were well-placed, they were well-connected, they were skillful advocates of their position, um, and yet Weizmann and his small circle of followers completely out-argued and overwhelmed them and defeated them, and the Balfour Declaration is proof of that. But the Balfour Declaration was the product of more than Weizmann's genius and his growing intimacy with the Anglo elite. It was the product also of enormous duplicity, not Weizmann's, but Britain's, and I'm going to spend the rest of my few minutes uh, telling you about that. As I began, World War I was a near-run thing. Nobody knew who would win it, and the British were looking desperately for allies all over the place. They found the Jews, yes. They also found Arabs. How could they beat the Ottoman Empire? Well, it would help if Arabs who lived in the Ottoman colonies uh, weakened it by rebelling against it. And in fact, one Arab leader, the Grand Sharif Hussein of Hejaz, of Hejaz uh, which is Saudi Arabia today, had been thinking about rebellion before even 1914 and had contacted the British to discuss it with them. They had turned him down, but now they remembered and they got back in touch with him. The British High Commissioner in Cairo was named Henry McMahon and he sent a letter. If you rebel, um, we'll help you. We'll help you establish an independent Arab kingdom with you as leader. And an infamous correspondence ensued, which historians have parsed with a fine tooth comb, trying to understand especially what the borders of this independent Arab kingdom would be, and whether Palestine was included. And to make a very long story short, Hussein and his sons thought it would be. But I know from having done the research that McMahon purposely used, and these are his words, nebulous terms. And he had, I'm quoting again, refrained from academic haggling in order to get Hussein to rebel against the Turks. Now eventually, Hussein would claim that he had a promise of Palestine in writing from McMahon in one of his letters. All right, but of course, so did the Zionists have a promise in writing for Palestine, and that was the Balfour Declaration. But there's duplicity compounded. In 1916, Britain and France um, brought together two delegates uh, who, assuming the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, sat in the foreign office with maps and crayons, redrawing the map of the Middle East. One, of course, was Mark Sykes for the British. Uh, the other was Francois-Georges Picot for the French. With regard to Palestine, they decided that it should be governed after the war by an international condominium of powers. Um, Later on, this was adapted and France would, uh, was going to get northern Palestine and Britain was going to get southern Palestine by and large. This is rough, but essentially correct. And the holy cities, Jerusalem, Mecca, and Medina, is that right? Or anyway, uh, no, but the holy city, I'm sorry, but the, uh, the holy city of Jerusalem would be governed by uh, an, uh, um, an international condominium of powers. Well, think about that for a second. This is the Sykes-Picot agreement. The Arab rebels were not fighting for that. They were fighting for Palestine to be part of their independent kingdom. The Zionists weren't after that. They assumed that Palestine was going to them. They would have been appalled when, to hear about the Sykes-Picot uh, agreement. And of course, when they did finally hear about it, they were deeply appalled. Now here's a third layer of subterfuge, and this will end it for me. I just have a page and a quarter to go. Um, Jews, Arabs, but there are also the Ottomans, and the government realized, 
especially David Lloyd George, realized that getting Turkey out of the war would do more to help Britain win it than anything involving Arabs or Jews. And all through the war, secret discussions, or at least secret discussions about secret discussions, were taking place regarding the possibility of engineering some kind of separate peace between Britain and the Ottoman Empire. Um, in my book, I trace the whole thing. It's a fantastic story, but I don't have time, obviously, to do it here. Suffice it to say that the most important of these discussions took place in January 1918, when the Prime Minister, Lloyd George, sent the most infamous arms dealer of the age, Basil Zaharoff, to Switzerland to speak for him with Enver Pasha, one of the three rulers of the Ottoman Empire. And Zaharoff was empowered to offer various inducements to the Turks to get out of the war, the most relevant of which was that Britain would promise not to take over Palestine. The Ottoman flag would continue to fly over Jerusalem if Turkey got out of the war. And I underline January 1918, three months after publication of the Balfour Declaration. Had the Turks accepted this offer, we would not be here having this conference. Nobody would remember the Balfour Declaration. It would be just one of the broken promises uh, that statesmen of all countries and all parties made to persuade men to go on fighting and dying. And I'll give you a few of those famous phrases. No annexations and no indemnities after the war, or open covenants openly arrived at, or most poignant of all, war to end all wars. But the Turks did not take the bait. Why? Because in January 1918, Russia was just about out, or was out, um, and they thought that Germany and they could still win. And this is why there was no separate peace between Britain and Turkey throughout the war. Whenever one side thought it wanted a separate peace because it wasn't really confident, the other side was pretty confident. Every time Britain was prepared to zig, Turkey zagged. Um, I'll close by uh, reminding you of the famous Greek myth. Cadmus slew the dragon. Athena told him to sow the dragon's teeth, which Cadmus did. And then armed men rose up from the ground, and we all know they're still rising. Thank you. Thank you, John. This was terrific. Before we move to our uh, next speaker, it's just interesting to me as a Middle East researcher that you think not a lot has changed in 100 years. We're talking about Israelis and Palestinians, but even when I, talk, when I think about Turkey today and um, um, Tayyip Rajib uh, Erdogan, who is really, um, his policies are of neo-Ottomanism and his center of activity in Israel is in East Jerusalem, so it's very interesting that going back, the Turks are still holding on to something that was very precious to them. Um, Mark, let's let's hear from. I'm going to speak to you about the American context. The rise of American Zionism, President Woodrow Wilson's attitude to the Balfour Declaration, and the impact of the Declaration on American Jews are themes that have long intrigued scholars of Zionism the American Jewish experience, and the U.S. foreign policy. <coughs> what I propose to do today is to investigate this complex triad and what their relationship reveals about the developing linkage among Zionism, Jews, and American power in the early decades of the 20th century. Now, to help make my argument, I'm going to trace a series of interconnected case studies, uh, key examples, if you will, that illustrate the micro and the macro dimensions of this phenomenon. So first, I'm going to dial the clock back to the period just before World War I and present Exhibit A, the micro case, as it were, of Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, arguably one of American Jewry's preeminent leaders in the first half of the 20th century. There's no question that Wise aspired to be a force in what he called American Israel. Following his triumphant return from Portland, Oregon to New York City in 1906, 
he founded the Free Synagogue. He cultivated a sizable following that included a mix of uptown elite Jewish families, large numbers of unaffiliated and alienated Jews, and a cadre of younger people who embraced his synthesis of Zionism, Reform Judaism, and Social Liberalism. Initially, the Free Synagogue held services at the Hudson Theater, then Clinton Hall, and finally Carnegie Hall, where thereafter Wise preached nearly every Sunday morning for more than 40 years to packed audiences. In 1912, Wise invited Woodrow Wilson, New Jersey's ambitious governor, to speak at the Free Synagogue. The two men were first introduced in 1911 by Henry Morgenthau, Henry Morgenthau Sr., an early Wilson supporter and president of the Free Synagogue. This was only the first of many instances when Wise gave Wilson the opportunity to use the synagogue as a platform to reach a broad audience of liberal-minded Jews. Later, after Wilson emerged as the Democratic Standard, as the Democratic Party's standard bearer, excuse me, he returned to address an overflowing free synagogue crowd on the rights of the Jews. That's the title of the talk. Denouncing Tsarist policy and amplifying his support for the abrogation of the Russo-American Treaty of 1832, Wilson won over many native-born and immigrant Jews who were suspicious of President William Howard Taft and the Republican Party's reluctance to confront the imperial Russian regime. May I suggest that what we have here is a prehistory of Wilson's future embrace of the Balfour Declaration? As the historical record shows, in this period, Wise actively sought to nurture Wilson's sympathy with the Zionist program and purpose, a sympathy that he later attributed to the Christian pieties of the self-described son of the manse. Wilson, for his part, assuredly recognized the Free Synagogue's significance as a conduit to New York's Jewish voters, estimated at over 110,000 in the metropolitan area and 68,000 in Manhattan alone, or roughly 13% of the eligible voters in the city. In the event, the 1912 election ushered in a sea change in American politics. Although we lack precise data for the countrywide Jewish voting behavior of the time, it is possible to draw reasonable conclusions based on polling data from heavily Jewish precincts, wards, and districts in urban centers like Boston, Chicago, and New York. For example, if we consider that for Boston, we have data for 1912, we find Wilson received 36% of the vote, Taft received 20% of the vote, TR, that is uh, Theodore Roosevelt, 36%, and Eugene Debs, the Socialist Party candidate, 8%. In short, like the African-American vote, the Irish Catholic vote, the emerging women's vote, for which we also lack precise data, there is no doubt that the Jewish vote was important to the outcome of the 1912 election. It was also at this juncture that Wise established a relationship with Louis D. Brandeis, the famous people's attorney from Boston, who was then serving as a key Wilson campaign advisor. Using the platform of the Eastern Council of Liberal Rabbis, a group Wise himself founded in a bid to increase his own political authority, and which became a forum for controversial topics and themes like women's suffrage, Zionism, the rights of labor, Brandeis was invited to deliver an address titled, The Jewish Problem, and the subtitle is, How to Solve It. This happened in June 1915, and he declared the following, let, quote, let no American imagine that Zionism is inconsistent with patriotism. Multiple loyalties are objectionable only if they are inconsistent. And this was Brandeis's dictum, and it became the hallmark of American Zionism in the early part of the 20th century. The bottom line is this. Wise, Wilson, and Brandeis understood the catalytic role of rising ethnic consciousness in America's political landscape. Unlike Brandeis, who did not have the temperament for electoral politics, Wise thrived in the public square, and he plunged into the rough and tumble of politics with Rooseveltian gusto. Both Wilson and Brandeis valued Wise's singular talent at wooing the Jewish vote. On the flip side, Brandeis and Wise understood what it would mean for liberal Jews and Zionists to have a friend in the White House. Was it unreasonable for Brandeis, Wise, and like-minded Jewish supporters to anticipate the potential return on their investment? If Jews had not rewarded their friends with votes, Historian Lawrence Fuchs reminds us, they would have been strikingly different from any other group which ever crossed the American political scene. Okay, now we move on to Exhibit B, the macro case of Zionism's impact on the American Jewish scene 
and the emergence of the Balfour Declaration. So now I'll dial the clock forward to the critical year of 1917. The Great War had been underway for three years. Wilson had been reelected to a second term, and Brandeis had earned the distinction of being the first Jew appointed to the US Supreme Court. In tandem, the overthrow of Russian Tsarism, which neutralized the animus of the Yiddish-speaking immigrants in America to the Entente, America's idealistic entry into the war in April, now approximately 250,000 Jews served in the US military in 1917 and 1918, and the British conquest of Palestine. Remember, the battles of Gaza, Beersheba, Jerusalem, and Jaffa all occurred between October and December. All of this stirred a fever of enthusiasm for the Zionist cause. Two distinct but interrelated fronts now opened up on the American Jewish scene. First, a tidal wave of popular support for democratization in American Jewish life surged forward in the movement for an all-inclusive Jewish communal framework. Initially, what was called the American, uh, I'm sorry, initially the American Jewish Committee, which is the group that represents the old line Jews who trace their ancestry to Central Europe who are established and elite financiers and so on, and the Jewish labor uh, movement, strenuously, both of them, the American Jewish Committee and the Jewish labor movement, strenuously opposed the call for what would become the American Jewish Congress. Neither America's elite Jewish leaders nor the radical Jewish advocates of class warfare saw any political advantage in submitting their authority to a larger constellation of groups and parties with the Zionists at the helm. Yet the Brandeis group understood this organic movement offered a unique opportunity to rally public support for Zionism and channel the power of a plebiscite to upend and supersede American Jewry's political establishment. In a protracted campaign, Brandeis's lieutenants crisscrossed the country, visiting virtually every sizable local Jewish community. Their movements and utterances were followed closely by the American press, including the Anglo-Jewish and Yiddish press. The building of Palestine's new Jewish society in the making, they asserted, was a corollary of Wilson's post-war vision of what Wilson called the self-determination of nations. In May, the pro-Zionist forces, with the Brandeis group at the helm, scored an overwhelming election victory. Now the second front, if you will, was the conundrum of garnering Wilson's support for the Balfour Declaration. As I explained at the outset, what might be called American antecedents to the Balfour Declaration had been evolving since 1912. And without getting sidetracked by an analysis of Secretary of State Robert Lansing and Colonel House's attitudes and their actions vis-a-vis -vis the Declaration, or the impact of Foreign Secretary Balfour's visit to the United States, or the fallout from former uh, US Ambassador Henry Morgenthau's Palestine mission, which was really a smokescreen for an ill-fated American effort to engineer a separate peace treaty with the port. What is clear from the historical record in this period is that the Brandeis Group was anxious, particularly by April 1917, when the US joined the Allies, allies excuse me, to harmonize the Zionist organization's political strategy and the Wilson administration's wartime strategy and post-war agenda. Historians Selig Adler, Leonard Stein, Herbert Parzin, Richard Lebo, and others have studied the issue and have offered competing explanations, educated guesses, really, for the crystallization of the president's support between September 3 and October 6 of 1917. What has been overlooked, I believe, is the indirect relationship between the three-year struggle for the American Jewish Congress and the evolution of Wilson's post-war strategy. For example, it's useful to point out that in September and October, it was actually Stephen Wise, at the behest of Wilson and with Brandeis's backing, who piloted the Zionist leadership's effort to disabuse American Jewry's elected representatives of the unwisdom, he called it, of holding an American Jewish Congress at that time. As well, working behind the scenes, the Brandeis Group sought to balance the interest of the Wilson's, Wilson administration, uh, which adopted a neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, and the Weizmann camp, which was closing in on the Balfour Declaration's approval. As the Brandeis Group reorganized, the Zionists could not afford to embarrass the president by insisting on a blueprint for Palestine's post-war reconstruction. To precipitate a rupture in the fragile political equilibrium that hinged in large measure on Wilson himself, would have been perilous for the Zionist cause. There is a great deal of feeling about the Congress, this is a quote from Wise, 
he explains euphemistically to Brandeis, and he continues, but I think we can explain why a postponement has to be, and I am hoping that the outcome of the negotiations will ultimately more than satisfy our Zionist friends, end quote. Finally, on September 23rd, after a few weeks of intensive strategizing about drafts of the proposed declaration, Brandeis and Wise met with House, that is Colonel Edward House, in New York City. And House writes the following in his personal diary, quote, they came to talk of the Zionist movement. They had received a cable from Weizmann of London outlining in two paragraphs the views of the Foreign Office and the Prime Minister, which they, the Foreign Office and the Prime Minister, were endeavoring to get the War Council to accept. I suggested against pressing the President for any public statement. I suggested that they bring the French, Italian, and Russian governments as near the attitude of Great Britain and the United States as was possible and then leave the matter there. I confessed that the President was willing to go further than I thought advisable." That's the end of the quote. On September 24th, despite House's admonition, Brandeis felt confident in sending a cable to Weizmann reading the following, quote, from talks I have had with the President and from expressions of opinion given closest advisors, I feel I can answer you that he is in entire sympathy <coughs> with the declaration, end quote. Brandeis's cable broke the logjam and provided Weizmann with the support for the October 6 draft of the British government uh, that was subsequently transmitted to Wilson. On October 13th, Wilson authorized House to inform the British government of his approval, and on October 16, the, Amer the American administration further indicated, quote, no mention of Wilson's approval shall be made when His Majesty's government makes formula public, as he has arranged that American Jews shall then ask for his approval, which he will give publicly here, end quote. So that's the cable that's being sent back and forth. Now may I suggest that what's going on here is that the Brandeis Group's centrality in this drama is actually hiding in plain sight. The close advisors and American Jews noted respectively in the former and latter cables were Brandeis, Julian Mack, Felix Frankfurter, and Stephen Wise. And moreover, in the ensuing months, despite the ambivalence of House, <coughs> opposition of the State Department, and anti-Zionist machinations of the former Turkish ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, and his successor, Abraham Elkis, the Brandeis Group, particularly Wise and Frankfurter, kept the flame of Wilson's support for Zionism alive and persisted in obtaining private assurances from him of his continued sympathy with British objectives. It would not be until August 1918 on the eve of Palestine's conquest by the British that Wilson issued his landmark statement, statement addressed to Wise, it also happens to be the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, indicating his public approval for the Balfour Declaration. When in December 1918, the American Jewish Congress finally convened, following the British conquest of Palestine and the armistice with Germany, 367 delegates from 87 American cities gathered for several days of impassioned public debates and stormy plenary negotiations. Wise and other leading Zionists, with the support of the Eastern European Jewish immigrant community, capitalized on this event to fundamentally alter the terms of the public debate concerning American Jewry's political priorities. A sparkling array of talented left-wing Zionist and pro-Zionist leaders, Chaim Zhidlovsky, Nachman Sirkin, Mayor London, uh, Joseph Berendis, Boruch Zuckerman, and many others, all underscored the commitment of the rank and file to the democratic principles and three cardinal issues of the Congress. And the three cardinal issues were minority rights, post-war Jewish reconstruction, and thirdly, the development of Palestine into a Jewish commonwealth. And that's actually a quote, the idea of a Jewish commonwealth. So the Congress is going farther than public statements that are part of the um, general arena. These are all issues that the Brandeis Group championed in the campaign for the Congress. And the net result was a broad-based platform and a new mandate for organized American Jewry. After the war, the delegation sent to the Paris Peace Conference by the American Jewish Congress at Woodrow Wilson's invitation was headed by the Zionist leader Julian Mack and the non-Zionist leader Louis Marshall, both distinguished jurists, and they both collaborated with European Jewish representatives in acquiring national minority rights for Jews in the newly created states of Central and Eastern Europe. Bernard Baruch, 
By now, a senior Wilson advisor was another important American Jewish figure to attend the conference. Baruch, as you may recall, helped design the Versailles Treaty's economic sanctions that imposed heavy reparations payments on Germany and contributed to the instability of the Weimar Republic. He was also an outspoken opponent of Zionism. It appears that Felix Frankfurter, a young Felix Frankfurter, who spent extended time in Paris at this juncture and who was in more or less constant contact with Brandeis and who communicated with or as the need arose, arose appealed directly to Wilson, um, was an interesting kind of counterforce here to Baruch. Uh, Frankfurter brought a laser-like focus to the legal framework of the terms of the post-war Palestine mandate. And he also was vocal in opposing Baruch's anti-Zionist counsel. For the most part, the Brandeis Group's efforts seemed to pay off. Indeed, Wilson, in a March 1919 interview that was widely reprinted in the American press, stated the following, quote, as for your representations touching Palestine, I have before this expressed my personal approval of the declaration of the British government regarding the aspirations and historic claims of the Jewish people in regard to Palestine. I am moreover persuaded that the allied nations, with the fullest concurrence of our own government and people, are agreed that in Palestine shall be laid the foundations of a Jewish commonwealth." End quote. This statement surpassed any of Wilson's previous public utterances. In fact, the language here went far beyond the President's August 1918 letter to Rabbi Wise, and his use of the term Jewish Commonwealth outstripped the Balfour Declaration's ambiguous pledge to support a, quote, national home for the Jewish people, end quote. Wilson, in effect, offered American Zionists a trump card. In October 1919, however, Wilson, who had not yet ruled out the possibility of running for a third term, suffered the first in a series of debilitating strokes that would leave him virtually incapacitated for the last 18 months of his presidency. For our purposes, what historical perspective helps us to understand, or at least to suppose, is that Wilson's attitude to Zionism and Palestine at this juncture, which became noticeably inconsistent, probably reflect, reflected his deteriorating health. In other words, his absence from public affairs left a political and diplomatic void to be filled by administration officials who were decidedly less sympathetic to Zionism and inured to the Brandeis Group's petitions. For example, after the San Remo Conference of 1920, which awarded Britain the Palestine Mandate, Stephen Wise requested a word of greeting from the President to be delivered to a special celebratory convention of the Zionist Organization of America. That's the successor to the Federation of American Zionists from the earlier period. And he uh, writes as follows. This is wise to Wilson. At this convention, Justice Brandeis, Judge Mack, and I will make clear again how great and decisive has been your help to the Jewish people throughout the months and years of negotiations, which, beginning with the Balfour Declaration and your own approval thereof, have led to the decisive act of San Remo." End quote. Now, for the answer to Wise's solicitation, we need look no farther than a handwritten note on the inquiring memo of Wilson's private secretary, Joseph P. Tumulty. And it reads as follows, no, W, W, end quote. So some, some, some concluding thoughts about American Jewry, Zionism, the Balfour Declaration, and American power in this period. <clears throat> First. It is, of course, an ironic twist of historical fate <coughs> that Wilson's physical decline, <coughs> excuse me, it's an ironic twist that Wilson's physical decline and the ensuing collapse of the Wilsonian vision of a new world order coincided with a tectonic shift in modern Jewish politics, including the convergence of the Zionist movement and the Allied powers and American Jewry's attainment of a new level of international authority with the end of World War I. <clears throat> Second, the abrupt change in the American political arena, symbolized by the election of Republican Warren G. Harding to the presidency in 1921, dovetailed with the brandeis weitzman schism. This clash of heroes was partly a matter of personal chemistry, no pun intended, but it also reflected competing American and European strategies for the future of the Yishuv, pre-state Israeli society. The Brandeis Group, 
which accused the Weizmann faction of fiscal mismanagement of the Zionist organization, insisted on handing the Yishuv's economic affairs over to a new administrative body to be composed of Zionists and non-Zionists who would not be answerable to the World Zionist Organization. For his part, Weizmann, who attacked Brandeis's plan as autocratic and undemocratic, faced a difficult political choice between, on the one hand, betraying the traditions and institutions of the Zionist movement, which constituted the source of his political authority, or losing the Brandeis group, which of course was the connection to American power. The clash came to a head in the spring of 1921 <clears throat> at a ZOA convention in Cleveland, Ohio, with the Pyrrhic victory of the Weizmann forces, led by American Jewish journalist Louis Lipsky over the Brandeis group. Brandeis's lieutenants now temporarily lost their political moorings, and they resigned en masse from the ZOA. It was a very dramatic moment, and it was reported in all of the uh, Jewish press. Rather than a total retreat from the fray, however, they created an, al an alternative Zionist instrument, the Palestine Economic Corporation, an investment vehicle that drove forward their progressive era vision. And thirdly, it is telling that even as the United States descended into the isolationism, racism, and xenophobia of the tribal 20s, the 1920s, organized American Jewry was well positioned to mobilize a countrywide campaign in support of the Balfour Declaration's more far-reaching implications. Though the Harding administration displayed a cool attitude to Zionism, for example, it refrained from offering an endorsement in July 1922 when the League of Nations debated the inclusion of the Balfour Declaration in the preamble of the British Mandate. And Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes generally treated American Zionist petitions in this whole affair with disdain and kind of a diffident air. Yet there was no question that a sea change had occurred in the relationship of American Jewry, Zionism, and American, and American society as a whole. And this was made clear when the Joint Lodge Fish Resolution, a congressional resolution, which explicitly endorsed the Balfour Declaration on behalf of the US government, was finally signed into law by President Harding in September of 1922. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was fascinating. Uh, we learned first what happened in, um, mostly in London, and then going to the other side of the Atlantic, understanding the developments there. Um, move on to I. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, you've heard two terrific presentations by historians. I don't hear a presentation by a political scientist. Whether it's terrific or not, you can decide. <laughs> it's the same with every anniversary associated with the Arab-Israeli conflict. One side's celebration is the other side's occasion for mourning and protest. Indeed, the Balfour Declaration was a major step toward an ultimate aim of Zionism, establishment of a Jewish-dominated state in the land of Israel, and accordingly, toward the catastrophe of destruction and displacement visited upon the Arab inhabitants of Palestine. Nevertheless, both those who venerate the Declaration and those who hold it in contempt are mistaken insofar as they imagine it to represent some deep logic of international law, or a profound expression of Western culture and values, or a diabolical plot of European imperialists. Both sides would be well to remember Kurt Vonnegut's explanation in his wonderful novel, The Sirens of Titan. His explanation for the rise and fall of hundreds of human civilizations. What was his explanation for that? In that tale, there is no profound meaning to history. Everything we take as, a grand or tra as grand or tragic was actually the result of a traffic accident. <laughs> Once upon a time, a messenger of the advanced race of Tralfamadorians was traveling from a very distant galaxy with a simple greeting for another race in another very distant galaxy. But his spaceship broke down in our galaxy, in fact, in our social system. And he was stranded, and he begged for a re the replacement party needed. Over 100,000, tens of thousands of years, the Tralfomadorians sent messages to him 
saying, don't worry, the part is on its way. And those messages were the Great Wall of China, the Roman Empire, and hundreds more human accomplishments and many more failures that he was able to see as he was watching Earth as his signal screen. From a Middle Eastern point of view, the origins and consequences of the Balfour Declaration are exactly as orthogonal, banal, and arbitrary as were the consequences of the Tralfamadorian mishap for Earthlings. In the case of the Balfour Declaration, the aliens are the European imperialists. Their interests, passions, and concerns, and we heard what they were in both the previous uh, presentations, they had virtually nothing to do with the Middle East. Uh, their interests, passions, and concerns, trivial or important to them, are not at all related to the concerns, passions, aspirations, beliefs, norms, and realities of the Middle East, the disposition of which occurs as an arbitrary function of the accidents of European, not Middle Eastern affairs. In the second decade of the 20th century, a terrifying war pressed leaders of European states, as we've heard, to fear for their lives and the survival of their states, riveting their attention upon, the great power, upon their great power enemies and allies. The categorical imperative was to prevail in the war. As a result, no matter how far-fetched, how duplicitous, or how contradictory to other commitments, anything that any person in a position of influence might imagine could aid in the struggle was highly likely to be done. Balfour's own words about the attitude of the great powers toward Palestine register the cause casual cynicism toward those whose lands would be forever marked by the decisions about their future incidental to the European conflagration or the organization of its aftermath. These are Balfour's words. Whatever deference should be paid to the view of those living there in Palestine, the powers in their selection of a mandatory do not propose, as I understand the matter, to consult them. In, so, in short, so far as Palestine is concerned, the powers have made no statement of fact which is not admittedly wrong and no declaration of policy which, at least in the letter, they have not always intended to violate. It was not simply the Bal fact of the Balfour de Declaration or its timing before Britain had even taken control of Palestine that were accidental, which is to say contingent byproduct of contending forces. As both Leonard Stein and Jonathan uh, Schneer have shown in detail, the cabinet's letter to Lord Rothschild was anything but a careful, profound expression of human values or British grand strategy. Indeed, virtually every phrase reflected highly contingent bargaining among Zionists, between Zionists and the British government, and within the British government itself, that is the war cabinet, as well as a function of the whims and fantasies of well-appointed individuals well-positioned individuals. It is accordingly correct to say that the Balfour Declaration was, was entirely accidental, a reflection of contingencies and concerns afflicting Europeans that had absolutely nothing to do with the realities and, and inhabitants of the region as a whole, or Palestine in particular. What is fascinating is to notice how artful and largely uninformed turns of phrase by ex-Etonians had massive ripple effects in the Middle East, similar to those apparent on the Middle East map as a result of Churchill's apocryphal hiccup. If you look at Jordan's eastern border, it's kind of like this because apparently Churchill hiccuped while he was drawing it. <laughs> to understand the odd wording of the Balfour Declaration, must, one must add to this cacophony of interests, fantasies, false beliefs, grinding imperatives, and hair-raising fears the traditional anti-Semitism of British leaders, such as Herbert Asquith and Robert Cecil, and the raw disputes among British Jews over Zionism as a possible threat to an assimilationist program. This latter split was rendered obvious to the highest levels of the British government by the confrontation between two high-ranking British Jews, the Secretary of State for India, Sir Edwin Matthew, who opposed Zionism, and Sir Herbert Samuel, who ardently supported the movement. It is important to note that after much wrangling, the final declaration contradicted Zionist proposals in a number of ways. The Zionists produced a draft which was almost entirely rejected by the British World Cabinet, and uh, here are some of the ways in which it's different. 
it omitted or endorsing the idea that a Jewish entity in Palestine would be a reconstitution of an historical precedent. It referred to Palestine not as the national home of the Jews, capitalized and with the definite article in the Zionist proposal, but to a national home for the Jewish people that would be located within it, within Palestine. The declaration also added, as you know, four lines, 50% of the text, on two topics wholly omitted from the Zionist proposal having to do with the rights of others, of Jews in other countries and of non-Jews in Palestine. Arabs angrily portrayed the declaration as the promise of a state for the Jews. Publicly, Zionists celebrated the declaration as the long-awaited charter, what the Basel program had described as a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine secured by international law. But privately, many Zionists and Weizmann were disappointed in every one of the changes made to their draft. So much so that when the declaration was translated into Hebrew, it was impossible to resist the temptation to restore at least some of the lost wording, including the terms people of Israel, Am Yisrael, and Eretz Yisrael, land of Israel, instead of Jewish people and Palestine. In the event, those Zionists who believed even this sort of halfway British support could be exploitable for the purpose of building a state on the way were correct. The history by which that objective was obtained is well known. What I want to stress here is the surprising relevance of the archaic, stilted, and as I have shown, highly contingent test, text of the Declaration. How strange it is that the arbitrary and convoluted wording of the 1917 Balfour Declaration can now, in 2017, be seen to describe a new approach to peace between Arabs and Jews in Palestine, the land of Israel, based not on two states in one country, but on two national homes in one state. The Jewish state arose with the, within the context of British and European authorization of the evolution of a national home for Jews within a single political administrative unit. A century later, the terms of that authorization can be understood as supporting further processes of evolutionary change that could result in two national homes one Jewish and one Arab, within a single politico-administrative unit, each bound to operate in ways that, to quote the Balfour Declaration, do not prejudice the civil and religious rights of others in the country. The most unusual word in the Declaration was home. As Arthur Kessler observed, the term had no clear or legal meaning. Even when incorporated after World War I in the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, it remained, quote, a complete novelty a term with a curiously sentimental ring, undefined by international law, and the object of an international treaty of far-reaching importance. The Basel Declaration, issued in German 20 years before Balfour's letter to Lord Rothschild, described the Zionist organization as committed to the cause of establishing a Heimstadt for the Jewish people in Palestine secured under public law. Often translated as home, Heimstadt is more accurately rendered as homestead or homeland. Herzl's contemporaneous diary entry in which he predicted that he had in Basel founded the Jewish state, Der Judenstadt, was a more accurate depiction of what the delegates who approved the declaration believed they were about. However, for public consumption and diplomatic purposes, explicit references to statehood would be deferred and ambitions to that effect even on occasion denied. You may be surprised to know that in his testimony before the Peel Commission, David Ben-Gurion himself denied that the Zionist movement desired a state or anything beyond what he called a home in a Palestine governed as part of the British Empire. In, in Israeli politics, the warmly evocative term home or bait lives on. Naftali Bennett's party, Bait Yehudi, Jewish home, is committed to the most expansive conception of Zionism's ambitions entertained by any leading Israeli political party. In the vocabulary of Israel's extreme right, distrust of the state of Israel and a desire to subordinate raison d'etat to raison de tzionut, allegiance to the building up of the Jewish national home in the land of Israel is imagined as a more fundamental commitment than is the simple patriotic allegiance to the civil state of Israel. This is the message as well of the nearly 100 meter collage. If you go to Israel, you arrive in Ben Gurion Airport, have a look at it a 100-meter collage that covers the towering wall of entry and exit at Ben-Gurion Airport. Celebrating the accomplishments of the Zionist movement, 
it concludes with a slogan taken from Herzl. Whatever has been accomplished with or without the state, the mission of the movement continues, for Zionism is an infinite ideal. We must, however, remember that the Balfour Declaration was a British document. In that context, the political genealogy of the word home, as opposed to homeland or state, is instructive. The demand by mostly Irish Catholics for home rule, first called home government, developed in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries into the single most dominant political issue in British politics. When Parliament passed the third home rule bill, bill in 1913, the prospect of establishing an Irish Parliament in Dublin pushed the country to the brink of civil war avoided only by Asquith's decision to back down and the outbreak of World War I, which then deflected attention from the issue. One of the main contributors to the preparation of the third Home Rule Bill was Home Secretary Herbert Samuel, an insider champion of the Balfour Declaration and the first High Commissioner of Palestine. So it is not at all a stretch to imagine that home in the Balfour Declaration was in term easily understood by British politicians and statesmen as an arrangement short of a state that would yet honor the desire for national political autonomy and cultural self-expression. Incidentally, and we've just heard about Brandeis, that is almost certainly how Louis Brandeis understood what was promised to the Jews by the Balfour Declaration. Brandeis in 1915, two years before the Declaration, described Zionism as, quote, seeking to establish in Palestine for such Jews as choose to go and remain there and for their descendants a legally secured home where they may live together and lead a Jewish life where they may expect ultimately to constitute a majority of the population and may look forward to what we should call home rule. What is of particular interest in the extent to which the conception of a national home in a country, be it Palestine or the United Kingdom, offers a model for the future of life in the country, Jews call the land of Israel and Arabs call Palestine. For if there can be a national home for Jews in that country, there is no reason why there cannot also be a national home for Arabs there. The focus of this model is on the non-exclusivist satisfaction of desires for self-expression and self-determination within a separate overarching political framework or state, a state that itself is not the locus of political self-determination by either party. For example, one can point to Canada with a maple leaf on its flag rather than a Union Jack as a state framework within which two national homes exist, one for Anglos and one for French Canadians. In the Canadian case, there's a provincial territorial boundary that has meaning, but a Quebecois or an Anglo citizen of Canada can choose to live anywhere in the state of Canada. In this context, it is fascinating to note that during the decades of the home rule controversy in Britain, British conservatives advanced a plan to finesse the Irish demand for a national home by establishing home rule all around. This would create separate national legislatures in Ireland, England, Wales, and Scotland, each of which would have autonomy but be under the overall state sovereignty of the United Kingdom's parliament at Westminster. Multiple national homes within a one state framework. This idea, also known in various guises as devolution or federation, arose as early as 1830 and was revived amid the 1913-14 home rule crisis by a variety of leading British imperialists, including Robert Cecil, Leo Amory, and Alfred Milner. Indeed, it was Milner who, as Jonathan Schneer has documented, personally insisted on a variety of specific changes to drafts of the Declaration to keep open options other than Palestine becoming der Judenstadt. Balfour himself endorsed the vision of home rule all round, imagining it as applicable not only to the United Kingdom, but as a mechanism that could accommodate nationalist desires for autonomy throughout the British Empire. In our own time, it is striking to notice the increasing salience of this vision of multiple administrative, political, and legislative semi-autonomous authorities operating within a single non-nationalist state framework. As a negotiated two-state solution has faded from probability to plausibility and now to probable impossibility, a host of new plans have appeared for designing a political framework for Israel-Palestine it is neither one state nor two states. These new plans are often unsatisfying in their details or their depiction of practical paths 
toward the realization, but they do all bear a certain family resemblance to what the Balfour Declaration can be interpreted as implying would be the appropriate long-term outcome for this country. The Confederation idea, for example, advanced by Oren Yiftichel and his collaborators, imagines a just peace as available via bottom-up mechanisms through, quote, gradual integration by means of two at least symbolically sovereign entities within a single administrative framework. Echoing Balfour but not citing him, Yiftichel and associates justified their proposal in the, in the introduction to a 250-page document. And they retain the principle of two states but evoke unintentionally the declaration's language. Both peoples, they say, share the same homeland, but they require separation because each of them needs their own independent national home. In another volume in this genre, one state, two, one land, two states, Israel and Palestine as parallel states, edited by Mark Levine and Matthias Mossberg, one of the contributors, Peter Wallenstein, not only evokes the national home concept, but cites the Balfour Declaration while doing so. He depicts the existence of two states in the same land, parallel statehood, as constituting a national home for each of the Jewish and Palestinian populations. Home is also the term used by another analyst, Teodora Todorova, to summarize suggestions by a variety of authors who imagine how the attachment of two collectivities to the whole land could be satisfied. She describes the thrust of this work as entering on the notion of home as opposed to homeland and thinking through post-decolonial cohabitation. A key theoretical basis for these and other related arguments emerges from the work of the international lawyer Gidon Gottlieb, whose 1993 book, Nation Against State, a new approach to ethnic conflicts and the decline of sovereignty, explicitly developed and applied the concept of multiple national homes located within a single state as reflecting both the implications of a post-Westphalian world and as offering new opportunities for resolving protracted ethnic conflicts over state control. I knew Gidon Gottlieb, and at the time I was a fervid believer in, and I believe it was the right thing to do, of a two-state solution. And I ignored what he was saying at that time. He died, and now I realize that what he was writing is just as uh, cogent as the Balfour Declaration can be interpreted as being. Gottlieb's basic idea was to shift focus from states to nations as the constitutive unit of world politics, casting the state as an administrative framework within which multiple nations can find non-exclusivist opportunities for self-governance, cultural expression, and national pride. Gottlieb described national home regimes as involving, quote, the issuance of two sets of passports to the inhabitants of a country, a set of national passports to the inhabitants of the national home areas, and a set of citizenship passports to the citizens of the states. Gottlieb argued that the concept of a national home was not new. The quote, the common national home is a concept that has its roots in history, culture, and myth. The limits of a natural home, partie in French or Heimat in German, are derived from ancient traditions rather than from juridical life. Thus, we can use the Balfour Declaration Useful, th thus can we see the Balfour Declaration as useful for pursuing power, per positive futures for Palestine, the land of Israel. A century ago, some of its framers, and certainly many Zionists, imagined that the wording and political and legal context by, uh, provided by the Declaration could be used eventually to achieve a Jewish state that would rule the entire country. Other Zionists, however, were enthusiastic about the Declaration precisely because it separated nationality from citizenship and did not promise a state because it separated those things in a manner deemed more honorable and more civilized than ethno-nationalism. One of the most influential Zionist thinkers in America at that time was Horace Kalin. Held, he hailed Britain's wisdom precisely because it did not call for a Jewish ethno-national state in Palestine. Callan saw the catastrophe of the Great War as springing from the ethno-nationalism of Germany and the Slavic countries. These, the movements represented a venomous infection of national statism. Immediately following the issuance of the Balfour Declaration, Callan wrote that England alone escaped the evils in, of infection. England, along with America, he said, had taught the world the truth that nationality and a national home was what peoples really required, not independent states. It was, according to Kalin, precisely a Jewish home for the Jewish nation that Zionism really wanted, not a state. I'm concluding now. The recovery of national home or national homes in Palestine, the land of Israel, 
as a potentially more attractive picture of the future than one or two national states dividing the country between them is one payoff of the analysis I have presented. But careful consideration of the Balfour Declaration and its effects does more than that. It also highlights a possible route to that future. One thing to paint a pretty picture of the future is another to have some idea of how you could get there. It highlights, instead of imagining that negotiations will lead to a prettier picture, than the conflict, fear, and resentment saturated political landscape of 2017, whether to one state for one people or one state for two peoples, two states for two peoples, or two homes for two peoples in one state. This is not going to be arrived at by new negotiations, whether Kerry or Jason Greenblatt or anybody else uh, 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 is in charge of them. The history of Palestine in the decades after the Balfour Declaration forces us to consider the more likely, that the more likely route to whatever future the country will inhabit, whether pretty or not, will not be negotiations. Much more likely is that the country's future will emerge as the byproduct of competition among political forces, including Zionists, non-Zionists, and anti-Zionists, as well as Jews, Arabs, and non-Jewish non-Arabs. The forms this competition will take will be both civilized and savage, and they will produce alliances that past patterns of affinity and enmity would not encourage one to think likely. What can be said with certainty is that no order will be stable that does not reflect the resources and sentiments attached to all the people who live in the land and those worldwide for whom the future of the country has profound or trivial but nonetheless, real meaning. Thank you. Ian, um, thank you for bringing us to uh, present day and to thinking about alternatives to a two-state solution. Um, as it's the news indicated, we are about to face another launch of peace talks between Israelis and, Palestin uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And you know, President Trump himself, in a press conference with Netanyahu, uh, in Washington said, um, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said, two states, one state, I look around and I like the solution that two sides like. I don't know what they like and I don't know what they dislike more, but at least formally the two st sides are committed to a two-state solution. Um, but it's interesting that the debate about alternatives is emerging uh, and I must uh, uh, explain that it's coming from both the left and the, and the right. So it's not a one-sided debate. But we can go into this. I just want to roll the dot. Let's go back historically. Um, maybe I'll just ask you, each one of you, a quick question, because I do want to give the audience a chance. But um, John, you finished your talk uh, saying you have a few examples about um, uh, attempts to start talks on a separate piece between Ottomans and British. And you gave us one example. Can you give us just another one? I'm curious what, what happened there. I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy to do that. I'm, I'm still trying to digest the talk I just, <laughs> I just heard. Um, all right. Um, well, I can very, um, I could spend an hour and I think everyone would leave. Um, um, the first, I'll, I'll do this quickly and then if you want to ask questions about it, for sure. Um, the, 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 uh, first, there was a rather interesting man uh, who got nowhere, um, uh, who was a, um, a, a, a Turkophile, is, is the way to put it, uh, and who thought that, the, that Britain was actually the greatest Muslim empire in the world because there were Muslims in South Asia and in the Sudan and Egypt, and he thought that, that Britain and Turkey should be at war was dreadful, and he tried to get a uh, a visa to go to Switzerland to talk to Turks he knew about a separate piece. He got nowhere. The only reason I mention him really is because his first name was Marmaduke, and I just loved his name, Marmaduke Pickthall. There was a, a second figure named J.R. Pilling who got a little further. He had important business interests in the Ottoman Empire, and he actually got a visa to go, a passport to go to Switzerland to talk with Turks. He knew Lloyd George personally. Then it became apparent that J.R. Pilling was um, uh, a self-interested rogue and he was quickly uh, ditched. 
Uh, so these are two not very important examples. With um, a much more important example was spearheaded by one of my favorite historical figures, a man named Aubrey Herbert, who was the second son of the Duke of Carnarvon and who was the half-brother of the discoverer of the tomb of Tutankhamun <laughs> and who was the model for John Buchan's Sandy Arbuthnot in the uh, thriller Green Mantle. And this, this gentleman, Aubrey Herbert, um, had many Turkish uh, connections and he was given permission to go speak with Turks in uh, Switzerland and he traveled there um, and it was a very clandestine affair. It's like something out of a John Buchan novel. He meets uh, Turks in special safe houses uh, and he picks up messages on railway platforms and he goes back uh, to Paris um, to report to Lloyd George and Balfour who were both in Paris attending a military conference and they thanked him uh, effusively for a job well done. Two days later, two days later, um, you referred briefly to Henry Morgenthau uh, and also to his mission. Morgenthau was an American uh, who had been the ambassador to Turkey, uh, no longer so, um, convinced President Wilson that uh, he could talk to Turks about getting Turkey out of the war. And the United States and Turkey had never declared war upon each other, so he could actually go do this. Um, and so he headed off and he was going to go to Palestine, uh, ostensibly to check on the, um, uh, the condition of Jews in Palestine, but really he was going to go and meet and speak with important Turks. Weizmann learned about this and stormed into the foreign office and um, put up a, a, a big fuss. And as it happened, the Foreign Office and Balfour and Lloyd George had lost faith in the Morgenthau mission because so many people knew about it. And if it got out that uh, the British were interested in talking to Turks, then it would mean that maybe they weren't so confident about winning the war. So they wanted the Morgenthau mission uh, ended and they allowed Weizmann to intercept Morgenthau in Gibraltar where he completely dominated the man and humiliated the man uh, and sent him home with his tail between his legs. He never, he never um, even got to Palestine. And then Weizmann went and reported to Balfour and Lloyd George in Paris two days before they had congratulated Aubrey Herbert on starting separate talks with um, the Turks. On this occasion, they congratulate Weizmann on ending separate talks with Turks. Um, so those are the, uh, the four that precede Basil Zaharoff's various missions. And I will only say about Basil Zaharoff, um, and I'm doing this in part because if I pique your interest, maybe you'll go buy the book. <laughs> Basil Zaharoff was the most extraordinary figure. He was the... Um, uh, he's the model villain for the Tintin comic books. Um, he appears in the Riley Ace of Spies yeah. um, as an as a, as a arms dealer villain. Um, this was a man who began on the streets of Constantinople uh, touting brothels uh, as a boy and then graduated to working for the Constantinople Fire Department setting fires. Um, in order to collect on the loot af afterwards and share, um, and finally discovered his true metier as, as the most infamous arms dealer of, of, of his generation. And he is the man, he's contacted by uh, a former um, Ottoman ambassador to Italy, whom he had bribed many times in pre-war okay. days uh, about setting up these discussions. And Lloyd George, uh, oh, so this is the last thing I'll say about this because I know there's much else to talk about. Um, Lloyd George, um, although he had congratulated Aubrey Herbert on his connections with the Turks, Aubrey Herbert was not speaking with the top Turks. There were three, the triumvirate ruling Turkey, the Committee of Union and Progress, Enver, Talat, and Jamal. And Lloyd George was worried that Aubrey Herbert was speaking to so-called second graders. But Basil Zaharoff was going to go talk to Enver, first grader. 
right? And so Lloyd George sent Zaharoff, and he did so without telling Arthur Balfour. So in fact, Lloyd George was preparing to betray not merely the Zionists and the Arabs with a separate peace with Turkey, but also his own foreign secretary who knew nothing about this event. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we'll do this just a little bit briefly, but uh, Mark, you um, spoke about the, I you spoke about what led to the Balfour Declaration in the United States, and then you spoke about the 20s a little bit, but I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit, discuss the implications of um, the Balfour Declaration for American Jews and U.S. foreign policies going forward, uh, 30s, 40s. This is a big topic, and I do want to take questions from you, so. Sure. Well, the, the, the implications are really not going to be realized for another couple of decades. In other mm -hmm. words, there's this kind of quiescent period. The Zionist movement is active in the U.S. There is certainly um, activity. Um, uh, at the kind of grassroots level, but um, the U.S. government isn't going to uh, do anything that's terribly proactive until after World War II. But by the time the Truman uh, administration comes to contemplate the recognition of Israel and the post-war developments and so on, post-World War II developments, uh, by that stage, uh, the Balfour Declaration and the Lodge Fish Resolution of 1922 <coughs> are recalled publicly as essentially the starting point for any continuing of the conversation. Thank you. Ian, I have a feeling you will get a few questions. Um, so I want, I know you're a political scientist and I wanna ask you a history questions, um, <laughs> if that's okay. What I'm reading is that if you, um, in recent decades, and historians here correctly, um, there's some research that focuses on Sephar Sephardi Jews that are native to Palestine. There were generations of Jews that lived there, um, and some of whom found the declaration um, a provocation that may not be needed. Some historians uh, wrote that many Sephardic Jews, and by many I don't know how many, enjoyed uh, close ties with the Arabs there, and they feared how they would respond to the Zionist project. Um, I have some specific examples. One Sephardic Jewish leader, Chaim Ben Kiki, um, really railed against this and said it's an unwelcome imposition on an Eastern culture by Westerners who had treated Arabs um, with prejudice, right? Um, and others, another one said that a young Arab movement was on the rise and that it would never give up their demands for the Balfour Declaration to be annulled. And you know, if you look now at the Palestinian president asking for apology, I guess they were a little bit right. I'm curious, do you know, and others can chime in on this, has anyone listened to them? The, the Zionist movement in England, in Brit Britain, uh, in the United States, has anyone, um, consider their pleas for maybe not separate us, maybe go for a one state, and I guess this goes to your argument before of the two, but um, it's more about how, how much their voice was considered. So I the Sephardim you're talking about are part of what were, was called the old issue. Mm -hmm. The old issue, that is the tens of thousands of Jews who lived in mainly the four cities, the various Jerusalem, Hebron, and Svat, who were not Zionists. They were, they lived off uh, mainly uh, philanthropic donations by Jews from all over the world who would donate so that there would, would be some Jews living a righteous, halakhic life. And naturally, they, they liked uh, the idea of living under the Ottoman Empire or any empire because they weren't nationalists and they weren't Zionists. And they were swamp, and they were important for a little while, but they were swamped by Zionism uh, and uh, never really had much of a voice. The reason I would, make one sentence of comment on it, I don't really think it bears up, uh, is this, that they would have been perfectly, when we speak of Sephardic Jews, it's odd, it means Spain, Sephardic, but these are Jews who came from Arab countries, it's mainly Arab countries. When we speak of Jews who come from European countries, we call them European Jews, or even German Jews, Ashkenaz means uh, Germany, we call them European Jews. When they come from Arab countries, they should be called Arab Jews. But, Hasbach, Halila, you call them an Arab. But someday, the way that politics works, when you have a, a state that is one state and includes half 
45% uh, Arabs, 45% Jews, and 10% that are neither, you're going to have those kinds of slogans and images reemerging in order to be the basis for cross for cross ethnic uh, political alliances. That's going to be the seedbed for the transformation of the country toward the kind of future I'm talking about. Thank you. 